Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's so nice to see you all here today. I hope you, you guys are having a great time attending the sessions and the meetings at reInvent. I also hope that the evening parties are only helping you rejuvenate and come to the session the next day. Uh, I'm Nick Hill, uh, and I'm a product manager with the Alexa speech organization at Amazon. And that's my awesome colleague, Trevor. And he's an applied scientist with the Alexa speech organization at Amazon. And both of us will be presenting this session to you today. Today's session talks about advances in machine learning that make Alexa sound more human-like. In this session, we're going to dive deeper into Alexa, the text-to-speech technology, and how we are using machine learning to actually make Alexa, Alexa's responses sound more personalized, natural, fun, engaging, and so on. Here's the agenda for today. We'll first spend some time establishing why voice AIs need to sound human-like, and what does it even mean to have a good human conversation? And once we've kind of established that, then we'll delve deeper into how we are using ML in text-to-speech technology to make Alexa responses sound human-like. We'll, we'll go through the session in one shot, and we'll leave a few minutes at the end for Q&A. So I hope that is OK. So when my, I often find my wife uh, talking to Alexa and saying thank you after Alexa responds to a question or completes a task. She often ends up joking, saying, Alexa feels like a member of our family. Little does she know, that's exactly what we want Alexa to be. How many of you here interact with voice AI regularly? That's almost everybody. Uh, that's great, right? And, and that's, that's what the trend looks like. And let's, let's actually spend some time looking at what the global trend in adoption of voice AI looks like. Voice AI is no more a novelty. Right? It's not a novelty technology anymore. It's, it's, it's in our houses, in our cars, and everywhere. Uh, according to reports, 37% of the population in the US, that's about 123 million people, you will use AI in, voice AI in 2022. Globally, in 2024, there will be more than 8 billion voice AI-enabled devices. That's more than the number of people on the, in, on the planet. We looked at the depth. Let's spend some time looking at the spread of adoption as well. Today, we don't use voice AI only for a certain instant uh, or a certain time frame in your day, right? We use it for multiple interactions across different times of the day and across different spaces you're in. It's almost part of our day-to-day -day environment, right? And that just goes to show why it needs to sound human-like and conversational for it to actually be helpful as and when you are moving around through your day. As you see, there are reports to suggest that voice AI is being used across domains, whether it's weather, music, entertainment, shopping, fitness, and so on. And these numbers are only increasing year on year. We spoke about the depth, and we spoke about the breadth of adoption. And that gives us a sense of why voice AI, it's important for voice, voice AI to sound human-like. But why does voice AI really need to sound human-like, right? The answer is pretty simple, actually. A more natural, human-like voice actually delights customers, and it's, it improves usage of voice AI. And as this usage improves, we actually see that it makes customers' lives more simple, more fun, more engaging, convenient, efficient, and so on. There is research to actually show that as the realism and human likeness of a voice increases, so does its use for, uh, so does its use for application uh, in social instances. We spoke about quite a few factors that establish why voice AI needs to sound human-like, right? 
Another motivation, important motivation for us at Alexa and Amazon is also what we want Alexa to be for our customers. Our vision for Alexa is for it to be an indispensable assistant, a trusted advisor, and a fun and caring companion for our customers. And to make this happen, it's imperative to bring together the best of machine learning intelligence with the best of human intelligence on parameters such as logical reasoning, perception, interaction, and so on. I hope that by now we've established why voice AI needs to sound human-like. And very soon, we'll take you through a bunch of examples where we've applied machine learning in text-to-speech technology to, to, to make Alexa's responses sound human-like. But before that, let's, let's just step aside for a minute and let's just establish what does it even mean to have a good human conversation outside of all the tech and the machine learning and outside of Alexa? Good human conversations are personalized. For example, the way you would meet, greet, or interact with a friend from, say, 10 or 20 years ago is very different from the way you would probably interact with an acquaintance that's, that you've met, met at reInvent. Right? In the prior, there's so much history, shared context, experiences involved. And you tune your responses according, based on that, that prior history and experience. Versus when you're, at, you're meeting someone for the first time, you're fairly reserved, and your responses are tuned that way. Good human conversations are contextually relevant. Imagine this scenario. Uh, you're working from home, looking at your laptop, and you have a stressed face. It's likely that your partner or your family member will come to you and ask you, hey, what happened? Out of concern. Now let's keep the setting the same with a, with a minor change. You're looking at your laptop, you're at work, but you're smiling or smirking away the glory. It's likely, again, that somebody in your family would come and ask you, hey, what happened? But that's going to be more in a fun and curi curious tone, right? It's important to note that sometimes, even though the text is the same, the way the response is delivered is going to be different just based on the context. And that's why context is so important. Good human conversations are relatable. Generally speaking, people from similar backgrounds, cultures, countries find each other more relatable than people from contrasting backgrounds. A few months ago, I was in London, and although I am a native English speaker, I actually had a tough time understanding people speaking English with a Cockney accent. We want to build Alexa for everyone, and hence it needs to be relatable. Good human conversations are pleasant and delightful. It's, it's super important for parameters like tone and expression to be perfect uh, in order to have human-like conversation. We can talk about more attributes that contribute to a good conversation, but at the very core, a good conversation is essentially emotionally intelligent, and it's empathetic. Now that we've established what a good human conversation looks like and why we need to have voice AI and Alexa speak uh, with, you know, with a human-like response, I'll hand, hand the mic over to Trevor, and he will take you through a few examples of how we, we use ML in text-to-speech technology. Thank you, Nikhil. Yeah. So before I dive into the details of the machine learning, I'm going to start by zooming out and showing you the Alexa stack and where text-to-speech fits into that. There's a lot going on in this slide, but I'm going to walk you through it with a simple example from the top to the bottom. Uh, so uh, I'm going to pick an example of Alexa interaction. It's one that's very popular in my house at the moment. Uh, so my four-year-old has just mastered using Alexa, which is good and bad. So uh, he's often saying, Alexa, play songs by Peppa Pig. So let's, let's, let's go with that. So first thing, he says, Alexa, the lilac top starts glowing blue, and you know that Alexa is listening. 
and then he says, play songs by Peppa Pig. So starting at the top here, the first step we go through is automatic speech recognition. So here, we're going to turn that speech into a text utterance that says the text of play songs by Peppa Pig. The next step in the middle there on the slide, natural language understanding. So this is going to turn that text, play songs by Peppa Pig, into what we call an intent. And so what this is, it's trying to figure out what did the customer intend when they said this. So in this case, they intended to play some music by a specified artist, and the artist is called Peppa Pig. And then the final step, we pass that intent to the relevant skill, which decides what to do with it and take the final action. So there's two outputs from Alexa. The first one is Alexa's voice. That's us. That's the TTS saying, shuffling songs by Peppa Pig. And the second one is the play. So when you see all of this that goes on in a simple Alexa interaction, you can see that text-to-speech is only one component in quite a complex system. But it's a very important one. For the customer, Alexa's voice is the tangible connection with the voice AI. So we're going to talk today about how we use that voice. We use Alexa's voice and text-to-speech to create a deeper connection with customers. OK, I'm going to zoom in a bit more and show you how our architecture looks like. Uh, so here we're doing text-to-speech. So we're going to start in the bottom corner with the text. I see we want with a cooler artist than Peppa Pig uh, as the example. Uh, so we're going to start with the text, and we're going to get to the speech on the far right-hand side. We do that with three components. First component we call the front end. And what this does is it converts the text into a string of phonemes. Uh, so phonemes are the smallest possible units of sound, uh, the consonants and vowel sounds. If any of you had children learning phonics at school, this is something that you'll be familiar with. But it's, it's the sounds that we use to create speech. Now, it may seem that just turning the text into the phonemes is quite a simple step. There's actually a lot of complexity hiding in here. I'll show you some examples of why. Uh, so I've got four examples in this box. Uh, the top one is probably supposed to be read as in 1994, uh, sorry, 1991, uh, talking about a year. The second one with the dollar sign in front is probably supposed to be read as $1,991. So here we have the same text, but depending on the context, the set of phonemes is really different. Uh, second example, the third one is probably supposed to be read as Doctor Who, talking about the TV show. Uh, but the bottom one is probably Manhattan Drive, talking about a road. So again, same text, two different sets of phonemes to read it. And you'll know that neither of them are dr, which is what you might naively interpret from this. Uh, for, for a little more nuance on this, if there are any kind of British English speakers in the audience, they might have heard it weird, me saying $1,991. We add an and in there. We say $1,991 uh, for that number. So context matters a lot in how we unpack that text into how it's spoken. The next component is the acoustic model. We're going to talk a lot about this today, so I'm going to slow down and go into this in a little bit of detail. Uh, so the, the uh, acoustic model takes the string of phonemes and gives us an output a spectrogram. Uh, so if you haven't come across a spectrogram before, you can think of this as a representation of the speech. So to help you interpret the picture, so we have a time axis and a frequency axis, and the brightness of the pixel tells you how much signal there are for that part, point in time and frequency. That might be a little hard to visualize, so I have a couple more examples here. Uh, in the one on the left here, this is one voice going through the different vowel sounds, A, E, I, O, U. And if you look closely, you might be able to see that even for one speaker, each vowel sound has a distinctive pattern in the speech representation. There's five there, for each, one for each vowel. The second one I think is even easier to interpret, so this is useful. This is someone just making an R sound, but with a rising pitch. And you can see as their pitch rises, you get more signal in the higher parts of the frequency domain. OK, so we take the phonemes and we give a speech representation. Final component we call the vocoder. And this is going to take that speech representation and turn it into the actual speech, a WAV file, what you hear through your Alexa device. OK, so now you've got our stack at a high level. Uh, but just before I move on, I, I want to give you the hint that this is hiding a lot of complexity, right? So the acoustic model is a big neural network. The speech production model, the vocoder, is another big uh, neural network. Uh, the front end is more of a hybrid uh, with some different components. But within the acoustic model and the vocoder, there's a complex neural network architecture. It's different in the two cases. If we dive deeper into this, it's pretty much the whole session. So what I want to do is say, if people want to follow up later, I'm super excited to tell you more about what's hiding in there. Um, and we publish a lot of work at speech science conferences as well. So there's a lot I can share for people who do want to dive that one layer deeper. But for today, we're going to kind of stay at this high level and talk about what the components do rather than how they're designed or why the neural networks are designed that way. Okay. 
I believe you will have uh, kind of got the point now. There's a lot of complexity that we're building here. So you should be asking, why? What do we achieve by this? Why are we doing all of this? So the first main benefit, in the days before machine learning, uh, customers used to complain that Alexa's voice was robotic or monotone, even that they could hear glitches in Alexa's voice. We know that the neural network models produce high quality speech, and we know in customer service that customers find it more natural, more pleasant, more human-like. So we have an improvement to customer experience. So that's, that's the big win, but it's not the only win. The power of the neural network approach is that we train these models and they learn something about speech production. They, they encode knowledge about how the different phoneme sounds are made, how they get joined together, and a model will even learn something about the vocal cords of the speaker and how that speaker is going to produce speech. And this is powerful because we can use these encodings, we can use these distillations of that knowledge to teach new models uh, new tricks. So for example, we can teach a model to speak in a different style. We can teach a voice to speak with a new accent. And this one's related. The fact that we have this encoding of the knowledge and of the speech patterns already means that every time we create a new voice, we don't have to start from zero, as we would have had to done before machine learning. We start with those encodings, which means if we want to create a new voice with new characteristics, we start from what we learned before, and it requires less data to train those voices, which lets us scale up. So we are going to give you examples of all of these as we go on, and I'm going to hand back over to Nikhil to give a first example. Thanks, Trevor, uh, for the great explanation on a fairly complex topic. Let me take you through a couple of examples of how we make Alexa's responses more personalized. What's, what's important to first have personalized speech? Personalization depends, of, depends on understanding customer preferences and triggering a response that is unique for that customer. Something, something as simple as when I go to Alexa and say, hey Alexa, good morning. Alexa responds back saying, good morning, Nick Hill, which is my name. Alexa has recognized the name, and that's what it speaks. Let's now look at a slightly more nuanced example in the context of TTS. Imagine a scenario when there's sensitive content involved. For example, a question on war. The way you would expect Alexa to respond to an ad adult would be different from the way you'd expect an, uh, Alexa to respond to a kid who's using a kid's device or using Alexa through the, through the kid's profile. When an adult asks Alexa what is war, this is what Alexa will say. According to Wikipedia, war is an intense armed conflict between states, governments, societies, or paramilitary groups such as mercenaries, insurgents, and militias. And now when a kid asks Alexa the same question. There's a lot going on in the world that can be scary or worrying. This might be something to talk to a grown-up about. So it's important to note that after we've recognized that it's a kid, it's, we've not only changed the text of the response, but also change the voice and the tone in which the, voice, the response was delivered. The, the voice that we use for the kids is more like a teacher or guidance uh, tone of voice that we use. Now, what's the role of ML here, right? As Trevor just explained, we have the text, we have the acoustic model, which, uh, which leads to a spectrogram, the, the vocoder, which finally leads to the speech output. But to actually train the acoustic model, we actually use a voice, a central voice database, which has large amount of data based on which the acoustic model is trained. In a pre-ML scenario, we'd actually have to, if we have to alter the voice or the tone in which it's being said, we'd actually have to build another voice database and use large amounts of data to just alter the voice in which the response is being sent. But with machine learning technologies today, we just use limited amount of data which captures the tone of, say, a teacher or a guide. And we just supplement that data with the voice database and use that to train, to fine tune the acoustic model to actually lead to a separate uh, spectrogram. And that leads to a different voice. Personalized speech improves trust with customers, 
it's a delighter and it improves customer engagement. In the example that I shared, our surveys have shown that kids actually spend more time learning math problems when they work with Amazon Math. And parents also prefer the, the altered voice that we're using for kids. I will hand it back to Trevor, and he'll take you through a few more examples of where we used machine learning in text-to-speech. Thanks, Nikhil. So context can mean a lot of things when we're talking about speech. So one example would be, if it was noisy in the hall today, I'd probably raise my voice. I might try and talk a bit clearer so the people at the back can hear me. So that's one way I might use context to adapt how I speak. But for now, I just want to focus on the conversation as the context. I'm going to start with a really simple example. It's one that Nikhil talked about earlier. I think a simple example is a good way to illustrate the point. So uh, maybe uh, this morning, I asked Nikhil, how are you? And if Nikhil tells me he's doing fantastic today, I might say something like, what happened? What happened? I want to share the joy. I want to find out more. And I kind of indicate that to him, uh, how, how I speak to him. But if, on the other hand, Nikhil tells me he's just having an awful day, I might say something more like, what happened? What happened? I want to show some sympathy while I'm asking about what happened. Now, for a text-to-speech system, in the old days, the clue is in the name, text-to-speech. We only get the text. So I've simplified the TTS to just one block in this diagram. But you see here, the input is the text. It doesn't know about the rest of the conversation. So in this case, Alexa's voice would say something that sounds more like, what happened? What happened? Which isn't really an appropriate way to respond to either of those conversations. So what we want to do is we want to give Alexa the ability to include the rest of the conversation as context when deciding how to speak to the customer. And we do that by training a new ML component. Uh, so we call this the emotional prosody space. Uh, prosody is a technical term, but it, it just means the tone of voice you use, the, the way that you speak. So this emotional prosody space is informed by well-known psychological models about emotions. Uh, the model is a 3D model called valence, arousal, dominance. Uh, some people won't be familiar with it. So valence is about whether you're feeling happy or sad. Arousal is to do with the intensity of the emotion as you're experiencing it. And dominance is a little harder to understand, but it's about how in control of the emotion you are when you're experiencing it. So what we have here is a model informed by um, modeling from psychology of emotions that can interpret the conversation and find an appropriate way to speak as the next step in the conversation, which means that we can say either what happened or what happened, depending on how we got there to what happened. OK, I think this is enough about what happened. This is a super simple use case. I'd like to show you something a little more real. Uh, so I picked an example uh, from music recommendation in Alexa. And I really like this example because I think music is very personal and music taste is personal. So this is a case where we actually have some emotional component to a conversation with Alexa. Uh, OK, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mock it up. I'm going to say, Alexa, help me find some music. And Alexa might say, happy to help. Let's find something you'll like on Amazon Music. Any particular type of music you wanted? Let's have some rock music. Got it. How about something by the Eagles? So, so far, Alexa sounds helpful. She wants to help me find some music. Uh, but let's say um, I'm not a big fan of the Eagles. Hmm. OK. How about we try some songs by Queen? I think you hear there now there's a more tentative tone in the voice. The first recommendation didn't go well, and so there's less confidence about the next recommendation. And let's say I don't like that either. No, give me something more modern. Oh, dear. I'm not getting you at all today. What would you think about something by Foo Fighters? OK, so now we've gone tentative and maybe even a little apologetic. I came to Alexa for some help. It's clear from the conversation this isn't really helping me at the moment. So the tone is now kind of tentative, perhaps a little apologetic. But let's say we're back on the right lines. That's more like it. Great. In that case, do you think you'd like Vampire Weekend? Now you're getting it. Fantastic. Pulling a playlist together for you right now. So in the course of the conversation, we've gone from helpful We've gone through to something like tentative, maybe even apologetic when the interaction isn't going very well, but then more back to sharing a little joy as we complete the interaction towards the end and share something. So we've launched this for selected skills in Alexa, and here's what we've learned when doing that. 
So the first thing, we found that for the music recommendation example you just heard, that customers are more likely to listen to the recommended music based just on the context of the conversation informing the voice. So this was a really exciting finding for us, because it said that even though the recommendations are the same, if we change the voice, if we change the inherent voice AI aspects of how Alexa is interacting with the customer, um, I will take some questions at the end if that's okay, thank you. If we just change the voice for how Alexa is interacting with a customer, it gives a deeper interaction. Customers are more likely to then take the recommendation. So this is a really exciting finding, and it was backed up elsewhere. We found that customers who had the contextual speech were more likely to ask for more information about a product they were browsing. And more generally, we found that customers were more engaged with conversational AI for longer and more often. Okay. As a final point, I'm going to talk about creating relatable speech. But in order to do that, I need to give a little extra technical background. So I'm going to take a detour to talk just a little bit about speech disentanglement. So I want you to imagine that your phone rings, and you pick it up really quickly, and you just hear three words. You just hear, hi, it's me. But from those three words, that might be enough for you to figure out it's your mum speaking, that she's got a bit of a cold today, but she's excited to tell you about something. So speech tells us a lot about the person who's speaking. So one aspect of speech that we've already talked about is emotion as something that kind of changes even from turn to turn in a conversation. But there are other aspects that are more inherent to the person, like their gender or their physique, that also influences how, how speech sounds. Now, I'm not saying that from three words you're going to be able to figure out exactly how the person is feeling and how tall they are, but you'll be surprised. Humans are very perceptive and very sensitive when it comes to speech. So if you hear someone speaking that you've never heard before, there's a good chance you're going to tell if they're feeling happy or angry today or at the moment. And you'll also probably be able to tell if they're older or perhaps younger or a child. You'll be able to hear that as well just from a few words of their voice. So another way of saying that is that the emotions and the speaker characteristics are two kind of aspects of speech that can be separated by us naturally. We can separate or disentangle them to understand more about that speech. And this is exactly what we're trying to do with a disentanglement for synthetic speech. So we view speech as like a rope that's weaved out of a complex weave of different characteristics that make up that speech. And what we want to do is we want to pull apart the individual threads in the rope, maybe change them, change this characteristic, change this characteristic, and then reassemble them to create a new rope that has the signal that we want. So what does that have to do with relatable speech? OK, so we want interacting with Alexa to be like talking to a friend or a family member. And we also recognize that we need a diverse set of voices to match Alexa's global customer base. And this thought around speech disentanglement gives us a way to create voices with different characteristics. So ideally, we'd like to create a different voice that's the perfect one for every person in the world. But this isn't practical. But something that gets us there is thinking about altering different characteristics independently so we can create a wider range of voices than is possible today. And we've already started making some progress on this. So first one on voice diversity, I think many of you will be aware that Alexa used to only speak with a feminine sounding voice, uh, but we released a masculine sounding voice. And that provided different options for customers who might find that the masculine voice resonates with them better. So we give more options. Another one is on language and accent diversity. So studies show that the voices we trust are the voices that we're familiar with. So there is a need to give the similar experience to different kinds of customers. There's a need to provide familiar voices and familiar accents. And so uh, in my part of the world, we made a launch on this recently. So earlier in November, uh, we launched an Irish English accented voice for customers in Ireland. Uh, we also have made more English accents available in the US. So for example, uh, I, if I were living in the US and I wanted a more familiar voice, I'm able to choose a British English voice. Uh, Nikhil actually is living here in the US. If he wants to hear a familiar Indian English voice, that's also an option now. So I'm going to tell you about how we achieved that. And we use two different classes of machine learning approaches. So if people are familiar with the field, uh, these terms, they'll already understand the meaning of these terms. I'm just going to explain them briefly and show how they apply to speech. So the first one is transfer learning. And normally in machine learning, transfer learning is about taking something we've learned on one problem and applying it to a different problem. Uh, but in speech, we're going to be applying knowledge that we learned about speech from one voice and applying it to a different voice. 
The other one I think is a super exciting area of machine learning. It's called zero-shot learning. And this is where we're able to solve problems where we haven't seen any data or any examples for that problem before. And for speech, that might mean creating voices for which there was no audio data. So I'm going to start with transfer learning. And I'm going to go back to this example of the Irish English voice. Uh, so you might be aware the British English voice uses an accent called received pronunciation. It's viewed as a kind of standardized form of British speech. Uh, sometimes it's called the Queen's English. I realize I should update that to the King's English, but I'm, I'm not ready to do that just yet. <laughs> so this is what it sounds like. Hello, this is your British English Alexa voice. Okay, so that's a probably a familiar British accent. But you might also be, be aware that most people in Britain don't speak like this. Uh, so there's a wide range of accent diversity in Britain, and this doesn't represent even most people in Britain. So as one example of how we're getting closer to being able to represent more people, uh, we've created an Irish English voice. And uh, I, I want to see uh, how much you're going to understand of this, but so this is our Irish English voice. The party last night was great crack. We got ice cream on the way home, and we were happy out. Great crack, happy out. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if you're picking up on that or not, but that's okay because people in Ireland are. So uh, I also am. So my wife and her family are Irish, and so I can kind of vouch for secondhand that a voice like this is way more relatable as a guest in a house in an Irish family than the received pronunciation accent is. So let's talk about how we built it. So we start with a database with recordings of multiple speakers in multiple different English accents. So this is going to include some speech from Irish English speakers speaking in their natural accent. And that will sound like this. Critical velocity is the speed that a falling object reaches when gravity and air resistance equalize on the object. OK, so it's great. The accent sounds right. But that's not Alexa's voice. So we're not quite there yet. Now, here's where we apply the transfer learning. So we now have some data about the accent, and we also know about the vocal cords for our British English Alexa speaker. And using transfer learning, we're able to convert that recording as if it came through the vocal cords of the regular British Alexa speaker. And that sounds like this. Critical velocity is the speed that a falling object reaches when gravity and air resistance equalize on the object. OK, so we're getting closer. So now we have the right accent. We've got the right voice characteristics. But creating that relied on already having the audio. So we're not quite a text-to-speech yet. So the trick we apply is that we create lots of these examples. We call it a synthetic corpus because our British English uh, voice actress did not read any of these. We created them by using voice conversion. And we use that to create a new database and train what we call a polyglot model. So that's a model that's trained on lots of different accents for the same speaker. And so then at synthesis time, we decide based on where the user is or what their preferences are to pick the appropriate accent. So we can have Alexa speaking British English or Irish English. We've used the same technology uh, so that our uh, US uh, masculine sounding voice uh, can be used in lots of different locales as well. I'm going to give one more example. Uh, this is our zero shot learning example. So uh, the star of the show here is the flow based decoder. So I'll take a moment to explain what the flow based decoder is doing in the middle of the slide here. So uh, you'll see there is going in two directions. So the first thing a flow based decoder can do is it can encode from a spectrogram. So remember, that's our speech representation, and encode that to a latent representation. But the key feature here is that it's also invertible. So we can convert between that latent representation, decode, and create another spectrogram. So you should be asking yourself, OK, cool, latent representation, but what's the latent representation? Why, why do we want to do this? What's the benefit? OK, so uh, in the spectrogram, this is just frequency and time. There's no part of this that I can change to switch someone from being British sounding to Irish sounding. There's no frequency that's only in Irish accented voices. It's too entangled at the bottom. It's everything is entangled together. We train the latent representation and we train the flow based decoder to create a new latent space where the things that we want to change are disentangled and it's easier to manipulate one of them at a time. And uh, on the left hand side of the slide are the different kind of things that we might want to disentangle and that we might want to individually edit. And I'm going to give examples, I think, of everything on this slide to kind of show you what that really means. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is accent. So just changing the accent component of the speech. So here we're going to start with US English. We're going to start with a recording of a US English speaker. We're going to encode the audio to the latent representation. 
we're going to change the accent part in the disentangled space, and then we're going to decode to create a new spectrogram. So this is what it sounds like. Here's the US. The forecast for Madison, Wisconsin this Monday is ice with a high of 42 and a low of 37 degrees. And the Indian English example. The forecast for Madison, Wisconsin this Monday is ice with a high of 42 and a low of 37 degrees. So what's cool here is that wasn't a speaker that we recorded to create that voice. There's no data behind that. It was created by changing one aspect in the latent representation of the speech. So there is, no, there is no Indian English speaker behind it. It's more like if the US speaker had a perfect English, uh, Indian English accent. So we can do some other cool tricks. Uh, this one is the speaker embedding. So here I picked two speakers. Uh, one of them is our US feminine sounding voice and one is the masculine sounding voice. But seeing as these are just two points in the latent space, there's no reason we can't interpolate between them. And let's just create voices that have some characteristics of the feminine sounding voice and some characteristics of the masculine sounding voice. Uh, so it might sound something like this. Can we go to Disneyland? 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 So what's cool here is creating new voices by combining characteristics from existing voices. But the real power of the approach is that you can do this independently. Uh, so for the last example, I've chosen two different aspects that we might want to change. Uh, so gender, so more feminine sounding or more masculine sounding. And then age, so more older, more like an adult, or younger, more like a teen. So in this case, if we start with one recording, she glanced rather shyly at the real queen as she said this, but her companion only smiled pleasantly and said, that's easily managed. So now we encode the latent representation. Let's change only the aspects that relate to gender and then decode to create a new speech. She glanced rather shyly at the real queen as she said this, but her companion only smiled pleasantly and said, that's easily managed. And now the same trick, but maybe only changing the parts that relate to the age of the speaker. She glanced rather shyly at the real queen as she said this, but her companion only smiled pleasantly and said, that's easily managed. And the final example, let's convert it back to a masculine sounding teen. She glanced rather shyly at the real queen as she said this, but her companion only smiled pleasantly and said, that's easily managed. Okay, so lots of examples, but the message here is that by being able to independently change lots of different characteristics of the voice, it hugely increases the space and the number of voices that we can create to be relatable to a bigger set of customers. Okay, so now I'm gonna wrap up. So you've heard some examples of how we can use machine learning approaches to make Alexa's speech more personal, more contextual, more relatable. And we've shown how that helps create a deeper connection with customers, create an experience that's more productive, more informative, and more engaging. So thank you very much for your attention.